It is now two o'clock and we will begin our webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us. And now Dr. Stephanie Garcia to provide us with the introduction. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you all so you can um, see the presentation. Um, thank you so much for taking time to, um, oh, there was something wrong there. Thank you so much for taking your time uh, to be with us today. I'm so excited about this topic. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. And I am um, excited to hear what you have to share as well. Feel free to uh, use that chat box throughout the day. Um, thank you again. This webinar is brought to you by IDRA's Equity Assistance Center South Region, or as we refer to it as EAC South. The IDRA EX South is one of our four federally funded uh, centers that provide technical assistance and training at the request of school districts and other responsible government agencies to build capacity of local educators to ensure a more equitable learning environment for all students. During today's webinar, we will be talking about the various ways educators can use um, project-based learning uh, to support student learning. We'll take a deeper dive into PBL as an inquiry and interdisciplinary approach that can be leveraged through this time of distance learning. Our goal for this series of webinars is to provide educators with immediate and sustainable long-term strategies and practical solutions to addressing the digital divide for your students at home during this time. Let's see next. So we have our wonderful IDRA STEM team as part of kind of behind the scenes that are always working on our STEM related content. So I myself, I'm Dr. Stephanie Garcia. I'm a former middle school science teacher here from San Antonio. And I also taught pre-service science teachers at UTSA as well as conducted engineering education research at the university. Um, I have two wonderful colleagues, uh, Dr. Johnson, who has, who's a math educator, and Michelle Martinez-Vega, who is our chief technology strategist. So we make up all areas of STEM, which is really exciting. And uh, once again, this uh, webinar will, hopefully our, our main goal is to explain PBL components with an equity lens and discuss applications of project-based learning across the curriculum and for distance learning. So I'd like to introduce our amazing speakers um, that have so much to share on this topic. I'll let them introduce a little bit more of about themselves during their segments, but I'm, uh, we're joined by Dr. Carmen Fees, a STEM educator from UTSA, Ryan Beltran, founder of Alequa, a nonprofit, Ms. Cheryl Hernandez, sixth grade teacher from Northeast ISD STEM Academy from San Antonio, and Mr. David Padilla from uh, Dwight STEM Academy. He's a STEM teacher from South San ISD. So I'd love for you, all of our awesome um, participants, to introduce yourself through the chat box. So if you could click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen, um, please include your name, where you're from, and if you are a teacher or family member, what is the age of your student, um, what subjects do you teach, um, we have many people from other educational institutions as well from across the nation. So feel free to also share, um, you know, what is your role in supporting students, what uh, institution you're coming from. I can't wait to read who's on the call. It's so exciting to see who's joining us from all around the nation. So real quickly to just uh, you know, briefly share the kind of background of what project based learning is. Uh, rigorous project-based learning involves projects that are designed around engaging topics and driving questions that compel students to dig deep during the process of inquiry and to think critically about issues and big ideas. So as you can see in this model here, um, it begins with, you know, a challenging problem or question. Students will continue through a sustained inquiry approach and they will produce a public product. So all of these big areas and big ideas are addressed through all subjects. So there's science connections and approaches to it. There's English and, and social studies and mathematics and more. So it's very much an interdisciplinary approach. It involves strategic scaffolding of content, skills, and processes with the, within the whole PBL experience. It also might mean using differentiation strategies to support student success. 
In all cases, it includes the use of formative assessments so that teachers and learners identify and address gaps in understanding throughout the PBL experience. So I want to make sure, I mean, this is an equity webinar, right? And that's the forefront of everything our DRA does. I want to make sure that we address um, the equity lens and how we should approach PBL with an equity lens. So this is a nice visual that I borrowed from EdWeek. And they, um, you know, it's really important to talk about the reactive and proactive approaches within project-based learning. So it involves interrupting deficit-based mindsets and structures within the school's uh, schooling experiences and students' learning experiences. So it's ensuring that all students, regardless of background, experience the powerful effects of a high-quality project-based learning approach and experience. It starts with making sure that every child is involved. So there's like, for example, a deficit assumption that PBL is not for every student, especially those who quote unquote, maybe are not deemed like academically gifted, maybe they're not in a gifted program at school. Um, and that's a deficit assumption. Um, we need to make sure that we're interrupting these kind of assumptions about students and anything that maintains low expectations of students, we need to interrupt that as well. Um, and at the same time, we need to be proactive in supporting students through quality and rigorous content instruction and providing individualized supports necessary for students in order for them to be successful in their learning experiences. Um, Project-based learning, it transforms students and inspires them to see themselves as learners, but also as co-creators, collaborators, and leaders within their school and communities. Lastly, I'd like to um, also share the direct alignment of project-based learning and culturally responsive teaching. So when you look at Geneva Gay and her works, scholarly works about teaching to and through cultural diversity, there's a strong alignment between these two frameworks. So they should be connected through every approach of project-based learning. Culturally responsive teaching is relevant to all subjects and it's multidimensional. So it includes all of the rigor and relevance that project-based learning talks about and is framed within. A really great tool that I'd love to share, I don't have time to talk about it too much at this point, but there's a link here that we'll share that will take you to uh, my dissertation about the 6E lesson plan. So we know within science teaching and learning, we usually use a model called the 5E inquiry-based model. Well, the 6E model is really being more explicit about how equity is framed within the science teaching and learning experiences. So this tool can also be used in your project-based learning approaches. Um, and you know, it ensures these three points on the right of the screen. Um, it's important to make sure that all students um, are, you know, uh, we're expecting that all students will succeed and their success will be supported throughout this process, right? So project-based learning prepares students for academic, personal, and career success, and it readies young people to rise to the challenges of their lives and the world that they will inherit as our future generation. Um, Project-based learning promotes relationship building, so it's important to consider that throughout these learning experiences because PBL is very collaborative. It's just built that way. Students will interact with each other, with their teachers, with professionals in the field, so it's important to build a positive sense of community and a great classroom climate and making sure that all students know that their voice is valued and it matters and their student voice can be expressed and elevated throughout this process where students are creating and designing this process really for themselves. They're self-directing their learning within these action projects where they can investigate and address critical problems in their communities and around the world. Um, lastly, it's important to empower students through this process. Um, it should include their interests and student choice, once again, is important in, in designing these projects and teaching through and to student strengths is an important consideration for educators. And once again, maybe a consideration of how their project-based uh, learning experience can incorporate service learning projects where they are you know, being empowered through this experience. It leaves a positive impact on themselves as well as their community through that kind of approach. 
And I think it's important to elevate student voice, even within this conversation, right? And so we have a student's perspective of project-based learning and the benefits of it. And I'd like to share a little clip of Emmett Decker, a student from San Antonio, who shares why project-based learning is a good approach for all students to be a part of. So there's actually a solution to this, and it's called PBL. PBL stands for project-based learning, and we actually do it in our school. So PBL, what we basically do is, I remember in sixth grade, we had this project where we had to take an invention, and we had to basically create an invention out of anything, out of cardboard or, or whatever, and we had to present it into a Shark, shark Tank-style presentation, where our teachers were the judges, and we actually presented to them. So that was our basically great. But what's fascinating about PBL is we incorporated all of our classes. So we actually took science, history, and math, uh, and we, we applied STEM to every single one of our core classes. English, we had to write a report because in engineering, engineering is basically two things. It's mathematics and writing. Whenever you do engineering, you have to write a report. It's not just science and you know, tinkering. It's, it's, you have to do all those things. So that's what we did. Now, I took that a step further. Recently, last year, I created a device I call SASE. SASE stands for Shooter Alarm School System Intervention, and it's a device to, to stop school shootings. And basically what it does, it's a microphone that contains an algorithm that is able to map the frequency and the um, recursion functions of a sound wave, and it's able to use that to determine what type of bullet was used in a shooting and relay the police automatically. So that's what I did, and I actually went to something called Pitchia, an organization based in Austin for minors under the age of 18 who want to start their own companies. And I pitched my idea to real investors. In fact, I believe one of the girls in the, the, the Shark Tank, just like the Shark Tank presentation in my PBL, was actually from the real Shark Tank. And so uh, was actually a content contestant in, one, in the real Shark Tank. So I did that, and so I won. And, and now my idea is getting funded. I see this, you know, when, when I become the CEO of a multinational technology conglomeration, I see that kids are already being prepared how to be great leaders. You know, when I become an employer, I don't want my employees just to, just, you know, be, be, you know, people who just answer questions. I want them to be creative and to come up with solutions to help our world. So, so, so that is why, you know, like I said earlier, the education system doesn't teach children how to, how to apply skills and things. They just teach it, teach kids how to make it easy to make, to make it easy on administrators you know so th that is why I absolutely love stem and this is why I, I love what we're doing all together so thank you awesome so from a student's perspective you can see how uh, this approach helps students to experience uh, learning in a whole new way a way that's more innovative and creative and full of inquiry and it connects to everything that they're learning about in a really holistic and cohesive way. And so from a student's perspective there, you can see the benefits of it. I do want to um, remind you participants to please share uh, whatever questions you have, burning questions along the way throughout this webinar, please utilize the chat box. Please share your questions there. At the end of each segment, uh, we will be sure to pause for a minute to address any kind of uh, related questions that we can cover quickly. And then at the end of the webinar, we'll have a longer time for question and answers. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And uh, Dr. Carmen Fees, if you would like to share your screen and begin your presentation. Oh dear, everybody. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about PBI in a story arc. And I do that in, because initially we thought we might have homeschooling parents in the group. So I hope I'm not going to bore you too much with it. Uh, let me share my screen. So this idea of PBL, which um, there's also problem-based learning aside from project-based learning, right? It's not a new idea and we can formally in education think about the work of John Dewey and Maria Montessori as informing the learning process as one that has to tackle not only a specific problem at hand, but also the habits of mind that go into solving these problems. And so if we are then thinking about problem solving as a habit of mind, 
then we also need to consider that this is not happening exclusively in classrooms. This is part of the human story, right? So throughout history, people around the earth have tackled all sorts of problems in the contextualization of the places where they live. And then from what they learned, took steps to better understand new problems that were coming down the line. So right now, with people being a lot more at home than they usually are, this is a wonderful time also in the family context to reconnect with things that um, can be framed as problems, but really also are just the things we do anyways. So gardening, cooking, those are uh, activities that are going on all of the time. Children love to help with these things anyway. And so the problems, the problem spaces that we give them just need to be appropriately shaped for the age group that they are in so that we can also make valid connections to the curriculum. Uh, I saw in the introductions that most of you are teachers. So I know I'm not telling you anything new here. Um, but the interesting piece is that this gives us an opportunity right now to think about complex questions in real settings as they are occurring in the homes. And so an example would be uh, thinking about, you know, now we're cooking a lot at home because we can't go to restaurants every day if we want to. Uh, what does that mean in terms of the family budget? There's a really nice mathematical exploration that is sitting right in there. By the same token, um, current events that are driving our experiences today largely that are the main reason really why we are at home so much are specific to the COVID-19. So if we were grabbing that as a context for a project-based inquiry, then we should do that also not only in a disciplinary manner, but in an integrated manner. So that in uh, the example I wrote out, there is a science, a social studies, mathematics, technology aspect to it that we could integrate right into a question that is framing roughly how does this virus spread? What's going on here? So how do, from a biology point, what, what is uh, a pandemic? Why would we even call it that? What are the marks of that? In geography, we could look at how this spread around the globe in terms of a timeline. In mathematics, we could connect that to exponential growth, the graphs. What do they mean? Why is it that it is growing the fastest in the middle of an epidemic and slower at the beginning and at the end. We could link it to history, epidemics of the past, the Spanish flu in the last century, or uh, the Black Death in medieval times. In technology today, there are amazing data sets available freely through the internet that anybody can access. So how are technology tools helping with tracking this? How do they help the medical profession to tackle the challenges that are part of finding a, a, a way to immune, immunize people against falling uh, sick from this virus? In San Antonio, uh, there is a virtual town hall tomorrow. And in the virtual town hall, this is focused on uh, the virus spread. So this is an opportunity also then for students here locally, and I'm sure they have the same kind of thing where you are at. This is a way to connect uh, in, a, in a very direct way, up to date with immediacy with what is known and what it is that people are trying to figure out. I also wanna give another, another example and that's related to water. Water is studied very often in problem and project-based environments. Um, an example from our sister institution in El Paso is a study that they did with the quality of bottled water, just water in plastic bottles 
that started with comparing water quality that uh, was from different companies that then ex ex uh, it extended to how does the quarter the the water quality change if the bottles are sitting for a longer period of time how does it change if the water bottle sits for a period of time in cool temperatures versus in hot temperatures and that exploration ballooned outward from there to look into what does that mean when water quality is a certain way and you get water as a big item for families that are financially not in the best of place. So it also became very much a study of um, equity issues. And with the topic of water, I'm going to hand it over to Ryan. I'll stop sharing my screen now. All right. Uh, thank you very much for that, Carmen. Um, that was a great segue. Uh, my name is Ryan Beltran. Uh, I'm the founder of a nonprofit, Alequa, and we run a program called uh, Make Water. Um, I will actually show you a little bit about how that program works. It's a PBL based program uh, where our motto is uh, education through innovation. Let's see, and so I'm going to kind of share a little bit about how our workshop uh, works and what, what it is that we do. Can you all see my screen, I guess? Okay, so we believe our water kits serve as a vehicle for multiple forms of education that leave participants feeling inspired, motivated, and accomplished. We believe by challenging students to innovate our open source water purification kit, they can learn st steam skills, STEM skills, coding, hardware development, the importance of water, and pretty much the list goes on. So what is, uh, what is our kit revolve around? It revolves around a process called electrocoagulation. And what we do is, here's a kit. Uh, seems like my screen has frozen. So, okay, so here's a kit. And what we normally do is we get these kits out to teams of students that wanna participate and they uh, take this kit and they actually innovate the process that we're using of electrocoagulation. I'm just going to show you a quick run through of what we do uh, to operate the kit. We make polluted water out of acrylic paint. We show that that it doesn't get caught in a filter here, uh, the, the quote unquote pollutants. And then we run the kit to actually cause the coagulation process to happen. And what's happening here is with the current of electricity, uh, particulates coagulate and separate and become denser than the water itself, becoming easier to filter. So you can see everything, all the particles there sort of got clumped together. And now they're getting caught in the filter. So the idea of the program is developing a water purification process uh, but creating challenges in a PBL uh, way where students are actually participating and innovating, but they're actually uh, learning about the technology at the same time and participating and researching and developing. Uh, and they're held accountable by these challenges and that sort of gets them inspired to work harder. And these kits, the process actually works smarter, not harder in, in making tiny microscopic pollutants uh, uh, more easily filterable after going through this process. So we think it's important because both the, uh, the, uh, the potential for education is huge there. Like at the beginning, I was really fascinated about the technology um, and I sort of learned PBL over time, uh, sort of organically that uh, this process was fascinating. I was learning more about it. People were inquiring about it and they had all these different water issues. And I said, well, what if they can actually try and solve their own water issues with this technology? And so we started building a kit that people could put together themselves. Um, so that's where we designed the kit that you saw. But even recently, uh, we 
you know, because everybody's now stay at home, we've adjusted to that. And I'll get a little bit more into that later. So when somebody participates in this program, how does that work? How does the Make Water program work? Uh, you typically would form a team. Uh, it can also be done individually. Uh, we try to aim to get our kits. Uh, kits are $50, but we try to get those kits sponsored and paid for through like water utilities or donors in the, in the area. And we have a waiting list uh, for signups for free kits. So as we get donations, we try to give out kits to students and educators and participants. Um, you, uh, once you form a team or you know you want to participate, you build a purification kit, one of these coagulator kits that I showed you. And uh, again, we try to get those kits, uh, we try to get as many kits provided uh, to participants as possible with donations and sponsorship. And then next, once you get a kit, you actually tackle a water challenge, uh, a challenge that can actually help research uh, or develop or innovate the technology in some way. Um, and in that way, you know, they're leaving a mark on the research and development of this open source technology that anybody can utilize around the world. These are the four different categories of challenges. One is water testing and research, uh, which is pretty self-explanatory. The next one is hardware development, where students actually and participants can actually create 3D printed uh, parts, designs, upgrade the hardware of the kit. Right now it runs on a um, little uh, Arduino microcontroller that you can code. And that goes to the next one, the coding and programming, where you can actually update the code to do new and more uh, more advanced things like we're looking at adding sensors so these kits can actually test water um, and give feedback of what is happening. And so every time the kit's being used, it is uh, sharing data with the community. And then lastly, creative. Uh, I actually have a filmmaker background and we also want to challenge students to tell a story and some of them can actually do a story challenge and do videos or something creative. Um, and, you know, some of the Challenges can be like, can we repurpose aluminum cans to make electrodes? Can we make a 3D printed filter? That's actually what one hackathon team did in Houston. This is our, a picture of our first 3D printed filter uh, that I'm very proud of. Um, it happened so organically and so fast. It, it has, it's not uh, quite there yet to be able to, to filter what we needed to filter, but it's a start and we're very excited about that. So I'm actually gonna advance a little bit forward. There's a kit with some sensors that some students added. And then lastly, you share the results uh, so that you know if you didn't quite finish something, you could share it for somebody else to take up what you have done and they can pass a baton to you and you can actually continue an innovation or, or go down a challenge route that maybe they already started. Um, so can we participate without a kit at home? That actually is what we've had to change to uh, because of social distancing and everybody working at home, uh, we actually are now working on and should be done by the end of the week, a at home kit that you can create out of scavenged materials out of the house. And part of the lesson is actually challenging students to find certain materials or variants of materials at home um, that they can put together this kit and par start participating in research and development. Um, so if you want to find out more, please go to our website, makewater.org. Uh, I know I spoke kind of a mouthful and uh, went through that pretty quickly. Uh, but we also do a lot of video storytelling about participants and uh, uh, collaborations. And we have how to's and uh, um, how to tackle water challenges and such. So if you're interested in the program, please reach out or check out makewater.org. Thank you. All right, we'll have uh, Mrs. Hernandez go ahead and share your screen. Okay. And now we're transitioning to uh, teachers' perspectives. So we have two incredible teachers who are going to share their experiences with project based learning. Okay, well, my name is Cheryl Hernandez, and I am a sixth grade teacher at STEM Academy. And what I uh, brought for the presentation today is just to kind of uh, go through uh, a few of the PBLs that we do on our campus. And um, this is my fourth year at STEM Academy. So um, I just like to enter with my first year there, we did two major PBLs that went across all content areas. 
And then as the years have gone by, uh, we break out into what is mini PBLs, which for those that are first time uh, trying to go into PBLs, it's, it's kind of nice to maybe try starting small and then break out if, uh, you know, going across all the content <clears throat> scares you a little bit. So um, this was something, was the first year that I did this, uh, this particular mini PBL, and this was with my GT English students and our tech apps teacher. And every year we read Beowulf, <clears throat> and there's an extension activity that has been built into the curriculum that uh, asks what constitutes a hero. So previously we uh, challenged the kids to talk about that, but then I went to the San Antonio Museum of Art last summer and I saw um, an exhibit about superheroes and it talked about their superpowers versus their vulnerabilities. So I thought I would incorporate that into uh, the Beowulf extension so the first thing we did was I challenged the students to find uh, inherited traits that were passed down uh, from their family. And I'm not a genetics specialist or teacher, but um, students always know much more, or there's certain students that will take the topic and they can expand on it and teach a lot. We kept it simple, although some of the students, as we began researching genetics, they gave a lot of presentations and explained a lot of things to the students. So. Um, my advice is even if it's not something you would normally teach because with, with English, and I saw there were some English teachers on this, um, I do a lot of science-based reading so that it ties into a lot of our PBLs. Um, but what we did for this one is the, they had to categorize which traits they would consider their superpowers and which would be their kryptonite. And they had to own their kryptonite, their vulnerabilities, and decide how they could, uh, the vulnerabilities would push them to be stronger. And then we designed a mask um, let me go on to that next slide. This is what the end result was. They designed a mask and they had on one half of the mask, they had all their superpowers, their strengths. And then on the other side, they put their vulnerabilities. And then they all made a hashtag and some of it dealt with their vulnerabilities. Um, there were things like brainy blonde, um, I'm bilingual, what's your superpower? And then for tech apps, they, uh, Put together an iMovie and the whole presentation encompassed everything they'd learned through this process with heroes, superpowers, um, things like that. So we had a, a big showcase and the students uh, rotated out turns and they uh, had families and people from the community came through and they got to view their um, presentation. So that was my genetics mini PBL. And then the one we kick off that we've done every year and it has grown quite a bit. The first time you do a PBL, you'll find that um, there needs to be changes. Each year you can add on things, delete things that don't work, but you just can't be afraid to go in and give it your all the first time. And the kids, as they're learning how to create and invent and do things, that's the whole engineering design process is there's going to be retweaks. So, um, what we did, this was across content, and the driving question was that there was a sick climber on Mount Everest, and they had to design a transport device to help them get him off the mountain. So we read the novel Peak, which is a nonfiction story about the youngest climber to summit Everest, and we invited Jordan Romero as a guest speaker. We did a Skype session, and he's actually the youngest climber that did summit Everest at the age of 14, and he's a great public speaker. He's 23 now. Um, <clears throat> but it, it brought, you know, some real world experience, you know, somebody with authenticity to the, to the PBL. And so some of the things we did in social studies, they did map skills, Sherpa culture. Um, they designed and built paper mache uh, mountains. And so you can see on the right, there's a picture of one of the girls um, who she built uh, the paper mache mountain. It took three days, but we have 146 graders. So that's a lot of mountains. So we would go to this outside area and they, um, we had what's called double days. And we, I combined English and social studies classes. So they would have two 45 minute periods to do their building of their paper mache mountains. Um, for math, they uh, scaled them according to the base camps. And science, they were calculating speed, they studied plate tectonics, and then in tech apps, they designed the model in SketchUp and a Google drawing of their transport device. 
And then they actually, we, we have a build day where we spent the whole day where all sixth grade, they only stayed with, they stayed with all the sixth grade teachers and they came up with their plan to build their device and they tested them out. Um, and our field trip that we had, we took them to Enchanted Rock and we had mapped out all the different base camps according to the distance that they'd learned about. And so they had to get to each base camp to um, <clears throat> do a challenge and then it was the first one down the the mountain which was just a ten of rock but um they they won that competition and they we made it kind of fun the second year where we had them make t-shirts and they had their prayer flags so they had kind of a themed themed team going down um going down the mountain we kept saying the mountain it's just um it was enchanted rock um so we always do a kickoff and then we do a wrap up and for our kickoff for Everest, we um, we combined a lot with the coaches. And that's a, a good thing with PBLs. If you have a, a community at your school, a culture at your school, that everybody wants to help out. And so every year, the, the coaches do give us their gym and they take their kids outside or whatever for PE. Um, and the football field, we started off and we had weight sled relays and there's a picture on the right and it's to show how the pressure up on the top, once you get to the top, it, we, we're always talking about how hard it is for the climbers to even move a couple steps that going 20 feet, it takes five minutes. So we put weight sleds on the kids so they could experience what it feels like to not be able to move as quickly as you would <clears throat> uh, down at a lower altitude. And then gym one, we had climbing equipment. Uh, gym two, we had an obstacle course and a rock climbing wall. So those were some of the kickoffs for that. I probably should have put that first. Um, and then <clears throat> this is the one that uh, that student was talking about, uh, Emmett, uh, about the shark tank. And he was actually in sixth grade and he's now in ninth grade. So it's great. That was my first time seeing that video. And it was so awesome when kids reflect back because PBL type learning it is authentic and they do remember and they take it with them as they go from grade level to grade level and it's not just this rote learning. Um, so I was real happy that he mentioned Shark Tank because that I think is one of our best PBLs and what we do for Shark Tank is uh, I used to work at the San Antonio Zoo and I wrote a program on biomimicry which is um, inventions that are based off animal adaptations so they had to invent sustainable solutions to an invention using an animal adaptation so they could invent a completely new product, a uh, new invention, or they could just um, improve an invention that already exists. So <clears throat> here was a couple of um, display boards and across the, across the curriculum, we could, you could see how we have science and English and social studies. And so what they would do is they would uh, do their portion in each of the subjects. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And they would build a prototype. So down here they have, um, they, they actually used a plant. So they were doing sugar cane since it produces the most glucose of plants. And they were gonna recreate the molecular structure and put it in an irrigation system. So they were coating the molecular structure of glucose, which again is advanced and beyond what I, could think of and it, it's just great that the kids will own it and they'll try it and they're not afraid and that's what's nice about about children is they are fearless so um and this right here the girls are up on stage and they were facing the sharks they have their invention their display board up on the stage and then they're they're asked questions by the sharks to be invited um there again were some more of the students presenting And here's the breakdown of what we did in each subject. So in, in English, we did a biomimicry intro. There was a PowerPoint um, about different things that uh, were invented using animal adaptations. I brought in some bio facts. We did owl pellet dissection, science-based stories on biomimicry. There's a book brainstorm that's true stories of 12 to 13 year old inventors. So we use that as um, our book. We read about three or four of the stories in there. Uh, science piggybacked off more biomimicry, levels of organization, both science and social studies got animals from uh, region 20. So we would do live animal presentations in the classrooms. Tech apps did digital designs of their prototype, iMovies and math did geometry and area of a compound shape. 
So build days would usually occur in humanities. So social studies in English, I feel like we are the most flexible of the subjects. So we would combine classes again to prepare all the display boards and the projects, prototypes. And then we invite, uh, we had about 60 judges come in and invite, um, and judge the display boards. There's 140 display boards. So um, anyways, that, uh, couple of more of the display boards of what the kids put together. And these are 12 year olds and they 100% do this in class and with their teams, a couple of them got into teams, some went solo and we absolutely keep the PBL, whatever they're gonna try to design or invention they wanna come up with. It's important to, for students to go with things that they know and that they're interested in. So if they are interested in science-based things, in sports, in fashion, anything that they wanted to start researching on how they can improve the invention. If you ha they have the interest to begin with, then um, they're more likely to uh, go in it with a, a stronger en enthusiasm, I guess. So um, I guess that's it. I think that's my last slide. So Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry, I talked fast. <laughs> yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences uh, from a teacher's perspective. Uh, next up, we'll have Mr. Bavia share his screen as, as soon as you click um, uh, stop share, he'll go ahead and share his screen and go through his slides um, with an experience that he'd like to share. Once again, I'd like to remind you, uh, everybody that's joining us today to jot down any questions that you have uh, in the chat box. Um, as Mr. Bavia go ahead and shares your screen and, and you look at your slides there, make sure uh, if you have any questions, drop them in the box and we'll get to them. Thank you very much. And I'd um, kind of hard to follow up on that presentation, but I will try. Um, I just want to give a little bit. Of, oh, and first of all, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, to give it a little bit of background, um, the school district that I work with is in the uh, south side of San Antonio, covering about 21 miles, uh, square miles. And uh, the district has 1,400 uh, employees. We have 8,700 students. And of those, 100% uh, receive free breakfast and lunch. So socioeconomic status is, is uh, low. Uh, we, this is my second year with the, um, the STEM Academy and we participate or we've purchased the creative learning systems uh, that we use. And let's see here, this is a, a uh, the screen of the server that we have. And so that our students are able to access because we have a one-to-one -one ratio for Chromebooks issued to our students. Each one of our students at the STEM Academy received a um, received a Chromebook and they were able to take it home. As a matter of fact, uh, came in handy at this time. Um, and so what we're, we've been working on is um, a, let me see, we go into the orientation. So we have an e-portfolio where they set up um, their e-learning, which is what they're doing right now. Uh, it gives them, presents them with a challenge. So we've gone from project-based learning to digital project-based learning. And it, it happened, so happened to be that the week after spring break was when the pandemic set in and we were sent home. And so right before that, we had left off with a competition that we have here in San Antonio that's called SA Smart. And our students had prepared a, a pitch. The... Uh, the problem that was presented was uh, on how to solve digital inclusion and uh, more specifically for those individuals that could not afford to have technology or internet access. Of course, we've solved one of the problems of um, the digital inclusion by providing them with Chromebooks. However, some of them, um, when they go home, do not have internet access. And so most of the students, or some of the students, when they uh, encountered that would have to come or wait to get to campus to be able to log into the district server and have internet access. So in, in doing, uh, presenting the problem, uh, some of the students were coming up with some solutions 
as far as um, we, they started researching, uh, looking into the possibility of having um, internet access for all, one of the students came up with the idea that uh, in the rural areas, they have to have light. So their, their proposal was to uh, create or utilize smart street lights because they were talking about, first of all, they started off with having internet access through those lights. And then in discussing that, another student came up with, well, what about uh, using solar power since we have to have lights anyway? Um, so with that, they started looking into uh, and how it would work. And so they had a proposal here as far as we were going to submit it to the city of San Antonio to see uh, how we could work with that. But so what's been going on right now is that we have for the for the um, the project based learning pro, uh, project, they'll have to go in here into their e portfolios. And basically we, we have how they're going to use the portfolio and then how they can start participating by developing their projects. And then even for those of, that are advanced students, extend themselves and add more to their projects. Um, so at this point, I'm working with uh, the core teachers um, because now we don't have the pressures of having the star test um, to start involving more of this uh, project into the different areas. Uh, so mapping out, for example, the areas that have uh, least connectivity uh, as part of the social studies, on uh, the math, uh, developing the percentages and the cost of implementing something like this. And then with the science, of course, uh, the technology also we're going to be implementing as far as uh, what would be the cost of trying to implement something like that. So um, the good thing about this, again, like I mentioned earlier, is that um, they can access this from home. And not only can we work with a current project, but they also have other projects they can work with and tap into um, so that if some students uh, get ahead, uh, they're still able to start using some of the other platforms that we have under the Smart Lab Launchpad. Um, so in, in the ePortfolio, I've provided some resources with uh, web pages or links that uh, they can go into to research the possibility of having that implemented here because it is my understanding from the previous uh, research that we did was that there are cities around the United States that have begun to implement it. So my, our challenge was, can that be recreated here uh, with the geographic area and the socioeconomic status that we have? Um, so they're, they're going to have to discuss the strengths and weaknesses of implementing something like this. And then, um, the students will be able to, under a program that we're using, uh, Seesaw, that we use Google Classroom with, they're going to be able to go in there and uh, document, post questions uh, that they can start discussing with each other. We're also using a, a Flipgrid that allows them to uh, make some mini presentations as far as what they think uh, will work best for our area. Um, so. Um, as far as the projects that I agree with, uh, with uh, Mr. Nandis that uh, you got to start off small and develop. So before we launched into this project, we had been working with uh, smart, small uh, PBLs, such as uh, developing um, handmade rockets out of just straw and paper. And right before we left, we had developed into working and making a, a air pressured rockets. And then we were going into this uh, project based learning that the project that we were that I was just discussing about. Um, so I don't know if y'all have any questions. I'm trying to look at the chat. Um, let's see, let me let go of the I don't see any yet, but it's possible during the breakout room activity that some questions might come up. Okay. So um, I basically that's that's my my presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mr. Padilla. Uh, we appreciate you sharing um, your experiences and 
I, um, once again, I just so much appreciate uh, teachers who are so busy, so incredibly busy during this time, uh, but they would uh, make it a point to join us um, and lead uh, a couple segments of this webinar. Um, I'd like to go ahead and transition into um, a concluding activity. Um, and so while my screen is loading, it might be a little slow. Um, I wanna go ahead and mention um, you know, some tips, again, just reiterate some really great distance learning tips and tricks that were shared so far. So, um, you know, thinking about sustained inquiry, authenticity, real world applications, none of that has to stop during this time, right? During this time of distance learning, um, it's really important to consider what tools could be used out there. And so Seesaw is a fabulous one that was just mentioned, as well as Flipgrid. Uh, really great tools for students to be able to record presentations, interact with each other, as well as a feature that we're about to use right now, which is the breakout room feature within Zoom. So there's many different ways to use it. We're going to go ahead and model through a small group activity. And we're going to utilize our breakout room space for just kind of a small group discussion. So uh, one question, since there are, um, you know, different levels of, uh, you know, experiences with PBL, uh, as far as what participants have experienced personally, some of you might be novice or more experts. So we want you to kind of have a moment of reflection with each other to discuss what might be your first step after this presentation to put PBL to use, right? And so, um, I see these awesome steps here. Michelle Vega is going to go ahead and break us out in a moment, but uh, we're going to send all of you into breakout rooms. Uh, when the breakout room message appears, you have to click join. At that time, it'll revert you to a small room with a random small group of participants, and you will uh, discuss this question. And I'll go ahead and put it in the chat box as well, just to be sure it shows up everywhere. You might get a pop up on the top of your window that also has this question in case you forget. Um, and then afterwards, it's going to have a timer counting down. Um, and it's going to push you back to the main group. Um, and so when the breakout session time is up, you'll be asked to rejoin the main group. At that time, uh, we're going to go ahead and finish our presentation, have some Q&A discussion from everybody on the call. And I have some great resources to share with you um, at the end of this presentation, too. So um, if you want to take over, Michelle, uh, we're excited about this. Okay, awesome. Um, before we actually break out into the rooms, though, I would like to show some settings um, and how breakout rooms work so that when you're rewatching this video, you'll remember so that you can do it on your own. When you look at your host menu at the bottom of the Zoom window, you'll see a button that says breakout rooms. If you decide to create a breakout room while you're sharing your screen, you simply click the more menu and then choose breakout rooms. Zoom will take the number of participants and try to create as many rooms to have even number of participants in each room. You can also use the automatic function or you can manually assign participants to the rooms. Once you're ready, you click Create Breakout Rooms. Here you'll see the rooms that have been created. And then you'll also have options to edit the room name or delete the room name. If you click Assign, you'll see the list of all your participants and you can create check boxes next to each of the names you want in that group and then click Assign again. If you need to move a participant out of one room into another, simply highlight their name and then you can move them into the other room if you'd like and you can exchange them with someone else. When you're ready, select Open All Rooms. Your participants will see a message, and then as soon as they click Join, they will be put into each of the rooms. If a participant has not joined, it'll show, and then once they've joined, the gray dot will turn green. From the attendee perspective, they will get a note that says the host has invited you to join a breakout room. They simply select join breakout room and then they'll be placed into the room with the other participants. From the host perspective you can reopen the breakout rooms and then you can decide to join whichever room you would like. You can also broadcast a message to everyone in the different breakout rooms. If you need to move somebody you can move them as well. When you're ready 
select close all rooms and then it'll give participants 60 seconds to wrap up their final thoughts and then it'll bring them back to the main room. If the meeting is being recorded in the cloud, it'll only record the main room. If you want each of the individual breakout sessions to be recorded, you'll have to assign a breakout room leader. That breakout room leader will then select the record button while in the breakout room, and then the host will grant recording privileges. When all the breakouts are done and the meeting has ended, the uh, breakout room leader can send the recorded video to the course instructor. With that being said, the breakout rooms for this meeting are not being recorded. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to go ahead and just put out some of these uh, breakout room ideas that you can think about um, until the main meeting resumes and everyone's back in the main room. And okay. now it looks like everybody's back in. Everybody's coming back? Yep. Yay! <laughs> This was like bungee jumping coming back, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it, it's, it's fun, but it, it takes getting used to. <laughs> well, um, as everybody, I believe, is coming back, I see the participants are growing again. That's good. Okay. Um, so I, I hope that, you know, you were able to share um, a little bit about what your next steps might be, right? Um, and thinking about um, next steps as far as how it could be applied in your school or in your home or your district, um, especially in considering the, you know, the equity lens, um, making sure we always have those on as we're navigating this, um, as well as, you know, considering all the interdisciplinary connections that could be made. Um, and then um, through distance learning, what are some really great tools and tips that we could put in our back pocket as we navigate these times, right? Um, and so that's something that I really talked about in my small group was I'd love to um, explore more about what Mr. Bedia talked about with uh, digital project-based learning because obviously right now it's crucial that we uh, adapt and we get to know these applications like Seesaw and Flipgrid and all those things um, and, and how we can implement those within our different approaches. So um, we'd love to, uh, let me go ahead and go to the next slide, we'd love to open up this uh, final few you know moments to um, answer any burning questions um, from the audience. If there are any questions for any specific presenter or just in general about this topic, we'd love to hear from you. So I'll go ahead and pause. Feel free to turn on your audio. So unmute yourself um, if you'd like, or you can just um, add it to your chat box. I, uh, I have a question sort of thought, I guess. This is Saul calls it ES speaking. <clears throat> Um, so it sounds like you're saying that we need to start really small with these PBLs, like pick something that's sort of uh, firmly within our wheelhouse and then from there get uh, larger and larger. Um, it seems like a lot, like a lot of teachers might all be doing this uh, same thing at the same time. So wouldn't it be advantageous to have PBLs that could merge my other one? Oh, never mind then. Hello? Yes. Yeah, you kind of went out. Um, it got fuzzy for a second there. Can Sorry about in? that. It's okay, Saul. Go ahead. Do we want to plan PBLs that can merge later on as they get bigger and bigger? So, like, should I be talking with, like, I'm a STEAM-related arts teacher, and it seems like what I should be doing is talking with the second grade team and the third grade team and the kindergarten team and seeing something that can sort of, like, what we're doing at school normally, but with projects that the kids can do at home? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love for our teachers to chime in on that. Um, if you have any um, ex advice for them, um, for the other teachers on the call, um, how does it work with planning with other grade levels and during this time especially, um, maybe there's more um, opportunities to do so, maybe to cross plan and um, for these kind of opportunities. So what are your thoughts on that, Mrs. Hernandez and Mr. Pavia? Um, well, in our small breakout group, I was, I was talking to Shannon from Nashville, and uh, we were just talking about that exactly. Um, as we started off with our uh, 
sixth grade PBL, our goal right now with STEM is then to take it and, and carry it over into the other grade levels. So um, with PBL, we the acronym could be project-based learning, problem-based learning, and in seventh grade, they're trying to do patent-based learning. So they're gearing the invention towards getting a patent. So we're going to try to do that next year, um, build upon what they already have. Um, the kids that are got into or in eighth grade when they come come back through and they they laugh at some of the ideas that they had they're like that was so dumb it would have never worked but then they learn as they mature and they can grow and build on their ideas um whole grade levels if you haven't done a pbl yet um i would suggest just starting at your grade level but um i couldn't really hear what he said because he kept his audio was breaking up a little bit so does he, is he an art teacher for all grade levels or i, I couldn't hear Sorry. All right. I'm a related arts teacher, so I see all the grades K through four each day. Oh, okay. I agree with Ms. Hernandez. I think that uh, we need, if it's going to be the first time that you're starting out with project-based learning, um, starting off with one grade level uh, and starting with small with the small project, and then I think starting to expand. As, uh, once the others see what you're doing, um, you might pique their interest after that. Absolutely. Does that does that answer your question, Saul? Maybe. Um, yes. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, for sure. No, um, I know that project based learning is is best used when it's you know a whole school approach. But I also know um, there's sometimes uh, challenges, right? And uh, that's not always possible right away. And so uh, even myself, going back to when I was a teacher. Um, you know, I was using project based learning within my science. So just my grade, eighth grade science, and my content. And I always hoped for cross planning with other, um, you know, content areas and subject teachers, but I never really had those opportunities. So um, at my school, it was just some infrastructure things that needed to change to, to kind of help move that along. So always start small, start where you can. And, um, you know, I think about Mrs. Turnana's example with PE and how the PE teachers, the elective teachers were able to get on board with it. I think that can definitely start small and start to build each year for sure. I see something in the chat box. Um, it says I'm a sophomore studying education with a minor in math and I work for a camp called GEMS. Oh, I love GEMS. Um, I create the curriculum for middle school camp and I teach it. The camp is two weeks and all the activities are hands-on learning. How can I incorporate PBL into a two-week camp? Um, and so this reminds me a little bit about the, the many PBLs that Mr. Hernandez was sharing, uh, but uh, any, I'll, I'll always give to teachers the, <laughs> the first response to these questions because they're on the front lines right now with it. So I'll go ahead and mute myself and let our teachers share. Okay, am I going first? Okay. Um, well, just the fact that you said that you're doing <clears throat> hands-on activities, hands-on learning at your camp, that already is the first step into doing a PBL. So anything that you're doing, any kind of racing that you're doing on the camp, if they're doing any kind of relay, you can put a math component, a science component, um, hunting for things. If they find rocks, then where does it go as far as, um, I'm not a mineralogist, whatever that's called, but um, you can really, any game or activity you're doing, you can definitely put, uh, just find a subject that would go with it and incorporate that into it. I agree, absolutely. <laughs> um, I, I think it sounds like you're already doing PBL. It's just not uh, specifically uh, looking at the each components or the core subjects uh, because you're going to be reading, you're going to be writing. Um, so, again, it sounds like you're already doing it. Okay, thank you. I'm actually the, the, the one with the question. My name is Calista Burns. Um, so our program, GEMS, we teach a lot of the girls um, about robotics, programming, and coding. Um, we teach them a lot about meteorology as well. Um, <coughs> and all of our activities are hands-on. We do not do PowerPoints because we found that all the girls will zone out within 10 or 15 minutes. So... Um, I was just wondering um, and just getting advice on how to incorporate project-based learning and um, that really answered my question. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that question. And and um, yes, feel free to contact us too at IDRA. We would love to work with Gems and support you guys. 
Um, it's a wonderful camp. Uh, moving on, I know we're out of time. We've got um, our IDRA resources that I just have to share. I wanna make sure that you know about this uh, Google form that you can fill out. If you need any technical assistance or support, uh, feel free to fill out this form so that we can contact you and make sure we connect you with the right people. Um, we have as well our learning hub, so make sure um, that you check it out because it's really where we house all of our resources in English and Spanish, our research and policy updates that are super important. They're also in English and Spanish and our webinar hub. Every week we have equity webinars. And so feel free to meet us again next week and you'll see um, all of our uh, previous webinars are archived and you can uh, watch the recording. So this will be, uh, this is recorded and it will be um, shown later. So if you wanna share it with any uh, teachers that you know, educators, family members that would like to watch this and learn more, uh, we encourage you to do so. And then lastly, we have our YouTube channel, uh, which also you can find us there and see Emmett, um, as well as other students, their presentations from a STEM ecosystem conference that happened here in March. And um, they have wonderful things to share, as well as um, all of our webinars and other um, really great videos are all on our um, IDRA YouTube channel. So um, thank you again for joining us. I know we're out of time, uh, but if you have any questions at all, please uh, reach out to us. Um, here is our email. You can email us at contact at idra.org. Um, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and I really encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter, our e-news. Um, you'll get quick links to all these resources that I've already mentioned. Um, so thank you again for your time, and thank you to all of our speakers who did an incredible job sharing everything with us today related to project-based learning at home and across the curriculum. Thank you so much. Yay, have a good day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. You guys are amazing.